Um, Pastor Eric's going to have a great sermon today. He's running the show. <laughs> and, and I just know he does, you know. I just know it. i got a feeling. And we're going to dust off an old song. We're going to dust off an old song for you today. So we need you to stand up. It took me and Connor a little bit of wondering why you guys weren't energetic and clapping and stuff, but you're holding the song sheet in your hands. So now we understand. So, but this is a clapper. This is a good song. It's from Israel Hoftum, and it's called You Are Good. St. James, those gathered once again in the air-conditioned Fellowship Hall, Sanctuary, Tabernacle, this is good, uh, and those joining us 
online. i um, been given instructions again where I can and can't stand, so but as long, okay, you give me the thumbs up. If I go too far, you know, we're good. Glad you're all here. Uh, let's start out. Announcements. Last week, you all saved me like you don't even know. So we made, I made the announcement of it was the ice cream social neighborhood, uh, meet the neighborhood up in the park, and that I had forgotten to announce the sign up. 20 to 25 of you came out and saved me. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, again, Michelle uh, and the outreach committee had done a fantastic job setting all that up. We had, thank you, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> Very good, Colleen. We had, I'm, again, fish stories of, they keep getting bigger, but I think we had about 25 to 30 neighborhood people show up. There was a group of about 10 boys playing basketball who came back for seconds and thirds. And when we were all done and the ice cream was starting to melt, we let them clear out the, the coolers. So there were at least 10 boys who were very, very happy with us. So uh, thank you for that for last week. Uh, second piece, you know, we're still here. Uh, the part for the air conditioner, they told us it'd be in by mid-July. So... <laughs> So last week I announced, I'm being told I can move forward. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so last week I announced we have a, a repair fund that, that we have as a designated account. Council has met. They've decided to uh, kind of get things in order, find out exactly what needs to go on, how much that's going to cost us. More information will be coming to you. I just need to say <clears throat> that when I made the joke about this being Eric's pool party fund, that was a joke. Somebody wrote a check and put that in the memo. I have to give the floaties back? <laughs> what? I have to give the floaties back? <laughs> yes. I just, I'm so concerned about church finances. That was a joke, okay? Joke. Um, <clears throat> what? Where's the party? Right, it was the ice cream last week. Um, but let me get, get to the announcements for today. Uh, there are, if you'll open up the white sheet, remember we start in the upper left. Uh, with what's most current, and that is VBS. VBS is happening, it is coming, and lots of things. Sign up your kids, sign up your grandkids. If you sign up a kid from the neighborhood, just ask their parents first. We do safe gatherings. We want, we want the kids to show up, but safe gatherings. Um, if you want to volunteer, there's a link there. There's a volunteer meeting Wednesday, 6.30, here at K Park Campus. Uh, my understanding is that our tradition is a shopping list out on Amazon. That list is up. Go to that link, shop to your heart's desire in order to help support VBS. Uh, are we doing some decorating today? At what time? At noon. So if you're available for decorating today, um, could just use your help. So again, you saved me last week. It's come through for VBS um, this week. And then uh, one other, just notice, we've got so many new visitors this summer, we're going to do a new member class. So that's on the lower right-hand side. Save the date. Uh, we've got a new member class coming up here shortly. That's enough of me. Let's get back to... Pastor Fokers? Prayers. Know. I'll do it in prayers. Prayers, okay. Thank you. We'll okay. turn it back to you. Okay, great. Great month. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat Eric here and, and step out in front of him here just a little bit. So my favorite Bob Fokers story... Okay, because his funerals this week and stuff and that. But my favorite Bob Folker story. My dad was Ken Miller. He used to go by Kenny, right? He was the head usher over at Franklin. Okay, so Bob is shaking everybody's hand, coming through the line, being a good pastor, right? And my dad and I are, are getting the bulletins all ready for the next service. And my dad turns around to Bob and says, "Hey, you know, great sermon today, you know, Bob. Good job." And and Bob looks over at my dad. And he says, "Kenny, you slept through the whole sermon." He, and he, my dad, without a beat, just, you know, just didn't miss a beat, just said, you know, Bob, that's the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> so have our prayers. You know, Eric's going to talk a little bit more about that later as Connie and the Folker family traverse this week. So let's start again. So if you would rise, please. We're going to do, uh, Lord, I lift your name on high. This is a song for Sarah. And we're going to get started here. You sing loud.
may be seated. Don't you love it when they keep moving your spot here, there, and everywhere? Uh, a reminder, uh, as we come into our prayer time, there in the red folders in front of you, uh, there are some blue sheets. So if you have a joy, a concern, I invite you to start filling those out, hold them up, and the ushers will, will come around and gather those. I'll um, kind of collect them in the midst of our, of our prayer time. Uh, again, a reminder that we are celebrating communion this morning, and so our offering will be during uh, communion. You can bring that up as part of, as your offering, as you come up to take communion, not during our um, post-prayer time. But in that sense, are those all the blue sheets? And I almost forgot the announcement. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, Reverend Bob Folkers, uh, former pastor at uh, St. James United Methodist Church, uh, he served all across Nebraska and conference ministries as well. Uh, we had announced uh, last week that he had passed away about a week and a half ago. His services are Friday, so this Friday, July 12th, at Trinity United Methodist Church uh, in Ralston. Check me on time. I think it was 11 a.m. Okay, so uh, if you're interested in attending, double check that time, but uh, Friday morning at Trinity uh, United Methodist Church just down the road. So we will keep him and Connie uh, in our thoughts and prayers. So with that, coming to our prayer time, uh, let's uh, take a moment just to center ourselves. Uh, I'll share our blue cards and then we'll, uh, we'll, do, we'll do some prayer, uh, some breath prayers as well to get ourselves ready this morning. So let's just go to God, kind of calm, calm ourselves and our thoughts. So as we come before our Creator, let's take a deep breath in. And let's remember those, those good things that, that God created us and God loves us. We take a breath in and we remember that we, we are children of God. And that means that we are people of worth. And we take that breath in and God reminds us of of our call to love our neighbors, to, to live that Christian life, to follow in the way of Jesus, even though it's not always easy, maybe not always comfortable, maybe frustrating, maybe there's roadblocks in the way, but we are, we are called. So we can breathe out that frustration. We can breathe out that stress we can breathe out that need to feel like it's all got to be perfect all of the time. And with that, Abigail shares that she's 18 today. Happy birthday, Abigail. And so a new chapter in life and family. Prayers for, uh, Joyce says, her son, Alan, uh, for a speedy recovery. Uh, got to come home this last week from the hospital, so prayers for healing and health. Another praise uh, from J.R. and Paula Paisley turned one on Friday. So for young life and all that, all that is ahead of them. And then a prayer Julie shares, um, Riley's been diagnosed with cancer. Riley is 15, and this is her third diagnosis of cancer. So, in the midst of all of these, gracious God, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that you hold the future. We 
don't know what is around the bend, but we know that you are going there with us. Yes, we love mountaintop experiences where we know that you are close, but it's in the valleys that we learn and grow and become stronger and our faith is tested. And we know that you are there as well. God, for your presence today, especially as we come forward for communion. We thank you. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus has taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My apologies, band. We're going to sing it now, too. If I had looked at the order of worship, I would have known that. <laughs> well, first off, before we get there, though, where's Abigail? Stand up, Abigail. Everybody. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Abigail. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> 18 is a big date, okay? 18 is a big date. Okay. So. Singing, uh, and that, Eric, you know, we're, we're, we're on each other's coattails right now. That's good stuff, right? Okay, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer for Matt Maurer. If you guys want to stand back up, please. This is a new one that we pulled out, and that we brought it back in for today. So uh, sing it loud. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day Forgive us.
Amen. Please be seated. Can I use this as a stand? Thank you. I have to admit that I was very jealous when the youth group went on their road trip. I wasn't jealous about sleeping on a church floor for a week. I can go without that. Um, wasn't jealous about uh, the hard work, the sweat, and the toil that they put in. What I was jealous about was the actual trip, the road trip, there and back, being in the car, that time together, being able to sing karaoke at the top of your lungs, being able to Well, the reason that I love road trips is because I'm in control. I don't like being at a flight schedule, or you you miss your connecting flight, or that there's weather, I see heads nodding, there's weather in Albuquerque that forces delays in Boston, and that makes my trip in Omaha not happen. I don't get it. I don't like it. So I prefer the road trips where I can see America through my windshield as God created beautiful America to be. I uh, get to play those. Abigail, did you guys play the uh, alphabet game or the license plate game? Nope. <laughs> the Volkswagen bug, the slug bug. Uh, okay, anybody older than 18 remember these games? There we go. Okay. Uh, to be able to play those games, sing that karaoke, thank you so very much. And my favorite part about it, the junk food. I mean, as soon as the junk food is done, that's when you pull off. Not when someone says, I have to pull off. It's when the junk food is gone and you need to, to pull it back together. On a most, my most recent... Uh, road trip. I was coming from Seattle. This is a couple years ago, but moving from Seattle back home and landing in Madison, Wisconsin, I heard out of the back seat those famous four words. Are we there yet? And then I heard, I'm hungry. And then the four words that we all fear to hear, I'm gonna be sick. I went from the left lane to the side of the road faster than the road runner in order to make sure, yeah. I have had road trips, maybe you've you've had this experience, where they didn't go so well. Had a road trip where I blew a flat. Had another road trip, uh, I rented the car, and the gas gauge didn't work, and I ran out of gas. My other trip, this was moving out to Seattle, I actually blew up an engine. The timing chain slipped. A $7,000 plague. That's what that was. I always plan road trips. I'm good at planning road trips. People want to have fun and the, the, the experiences together and it's that time in the car, they are, they're locked in, and they can't look at their phones. And we've got to build those relationships. And yet, on this particular road trip, everything felt like it was spinning out of control. Things were starting to converge on chaos, and I was absolutely plagued with problems. You see what I did there, right? The text for today is about the plagues. <laughs> so... Let's read here. From Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, this is is kind of the setup. The plagues happen over multiple chapters, but this is the very beginning uh, where God is telling Moses and Aaron uh, what's about to happen. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. Your brother Aaron will be the one who speaks for you. You will speak all that I tell you. Your brother Aaron will tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his land. But I will make Pharaoh's heart hard. 
So I will do many powerful works for the people to see in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt by great acts that will punish the Egyptians. I will bring out my family groups, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I put my hand upon Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So Moses and Aaron did what the Lord told them to do. Moses, here's key, folks. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83. Abigail, you got a long time to do God's work. <laughs> when they spoke to Pharaoh. So this is the text. This is the beginning into, into the Ten Commandments. Let me give you just a little bit of historical context. So, how many plagues? Ten. The ten plagues. Uh, Moses, on top of a mountain, he receives two tablets, and on that are how many commandments? Very good. Now, here's the kicker. How many major gods are there in the Egyptian religion? Very good. Do you think that's by accident? It's not. So here, within the context. So the plagues are actually counter-creation to the ten steps of creation that we find in Genesis 1. So do you remember when God created light, heavens, and earth? There were ten different steps that God took, and each of these plagues undoes one of them uncreates, reverses everything that, that God had done. And each of those plagues was specific to one of the ten major gods in the Egyptian religion. Maybe you've heard of Horus or Isis, Osiris, Ra. Each of those gods had a different, um, different place within the, the life and the religion of, of Egypt. And so each plague was kind of messing with one of the... It Basically, the authors of Exodus are going, <laughs> my God's better than your God. <laughs> That's the point to these plagues. Okay? The uncreating, the undoing, to allow chaos to happen again. Yahweh, as we, as we remember from Genesis 1, Yahweh took all of that chaos and put it into order in six days. And this is, not all at once, but this is one day at a time, one plague at a time, messing with one Egyptian god at a time, is undoing that creation and letting the chaos kind of play a little havoc for a while. Basically, the authors are saying, my one god is better than all ten of your gods put together. My one god is stronger. My one god is more powerful. And the text tells us that how Pharaoh reacted was with a hard heart. Got to tell you, when the tire blew out, I had a hard heart. When that $7,000 engine blew up, I did not react so well. Goes in the machine. Uh, when traveling from Franklin campus to Cape Heart campus this morning and that person cut me off, yeah, I was not my best self. I have a tendency to be reactive. The biblical term for that is that we have that hard heart. It's that we pull in and we only take care of ourselves and we, when things are not going our way, we, we hunker down and we try to take more control. Am I the only one who experiences this? I didn't think so. So I have this morning a gift for you. If you'll take out the white insert. I don't know if you heard this or if you remember this um, in my introduction, but uh, I have a PhD in behavioral psychology. 
I know how to manipulate, I mean motivate <laughs> people and I'm going to save you some money. You don't have to go buy the, the latest New York Times bestseller book. You don't need to find, um, you know, Ladies Home Journal. You know, they've got all of those little quizzes on how to be, you know, a better part. Apparently nobody reads Ladies Home Journal anymore, okay? Uh, you know, all those online surveys or quizzes that they give. I'm going to, don't do any of those. I'm going to share with you this morning my PhD research in which I found a way to get out of that hard heart that when we find ourselves in that emotional, reactive, knee-jerk kind of place, I have done the research, and it's valid. It works. Four exercises. They are quick, 60 seconds each. They are based in theory. What that means for you is that they work, okay? Empirically valid, it means the math worked out. And in those four quick and easy steps, we can move from emotional reactivity to what I call our best selves, but it's that we are intentional. And we are responding, and we are choosing how we want to behave, show up, interact, instead of just letting that, if you've all heard the lizard brain, that we just let that take over. So to begin, I want to share with you my research, okay? Any of you ever watch uh, the TV show Friends? I know it was a while ago, but if you remember the character Ross Geller, at one point, Ross was having a very difficult day. He was faced with some plagues. Some things were being thrown at him. He wasn't in control. He didn't like it. Um, the woman that he loved, Rachel, was dating his best friend, Joey, and they were going on a double date, if you remember this scene. Ross comes walking out of the kitchen. He has a plate of enchiladas straight from the oven, but he's not wearing any oven mitts. And his voice gets real high and squeaky. And his friends ask him, Ross, are you okay? And he goes, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't know why my voice I'm fine. Same word, different scene, different movie uh, from uh, The Italian Job, the newer version. It's Mark Wahlberg and uh, Kiefer Sutherland. They're both um, thieves. They steal things. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland is the mentor. He asks Mark Wahlberg, a job is coming up, and he says, how you feeling? And Mark says, I'm fine. And in unison, they respond together. You know that fine means freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Anybody feeling fine today? <laughs> That's our normal state, isn't it? Now, I can say that because I have a PhD and because I've done the research. It's not that I'm reading your minds. But most of us are fine. I can give you, you want the big word? It's called self-differentiation. It's our ability to, to deal with stress and anxiety. Some of us have higher levels. Some of us have lower levels. Um, some of us are reactive like Pharaoh. But most of us, if we took that score, um, it scores from 0 to 100. Most folks score below 50. Healthy people only score about 50, which means that healthy people struggle with the difference between feeling fine and being their best selves. We spend a lot of time just feeling fine. And that means that we normally are reactive and we go to the four Fs. Have any of you heard of the typical reaction, fight or flight? There's two new ones. They are called freeze and fawn. Fight means to the death. We have an argument. I will win because I am right and you are wrong. There's no... I mean, that's fight. You just, you're in it to win it. Flight, some people, just, some people just leave. It's like, I don't like this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. There's, this isn't going to work out. I'm not going to get my way, and so I just... Leave, and all of you are going, yep, I know that person. 
that's my sibling, or I married that person, or, you know, it's real good. We can, we can point fingers. But then the, the newer ones, there is um, to freeze, that good old joke of, you know, an ostrich sticks its head in the sand. The freeze is that if I just ignore it long enough, the problem will go away. My mother told me that on a weekly basis as I was growing up. <laughs> You just ignore it. Or the other option is my go-to, fawn. Just keep everybody happy. And if everybody's happy, then they'll be happy with me. The trouble is, is that you're not happy with you, and you're not happy with you, and you're not happy with you, which means that if I keep all of you happy, ain't none of you happy, and I've just lost. So then I defer to fight. And I dig my heels in, in whatever argument that we are facing. So here's the place within that baptized imagination. I'm thinking that we face those plagues in our lives, not just on road trips, but that happens within, within our relationships. That happens between um, spouses, significant others. That happens between parents and children. It happens between friends. Um, Co-workers and bosses and classmates at school. We're constantly having these plagues that are happening to us. Things are not going the way that we wanted them to. We recognize we are not in control and we're not fine. And instead of trying all of those other options that we know are emotional that they are reactive, and we know they don't work because we've tried them. I want to offer you the four elements of the best self formula. Did I tell you that they were based in theory? Experience, validated experientially? Um, but they're also out of scripture. So, again, backside of, of the handout. There's more detail there than what we're going to go through, but I wanted you to have it. But let's talk about those four steps. So B, we've already done this one. We did it in prayer. Breathe deeply. You know how many breaths it takes for you to get out of the emotions? Three. Anybody ever tell you to count to ten? You only got to count to five. Just find your pulse and get it to go a little bit slower, and you're on your way. The point to this exercise, again, and it takes about 60 seconds, the point is, is that it just makes you stop. It makes us pause. Or as scripture says, to be still and know that I am God. To, as scripture says, be in an attitude of prayer at all times. Or, I love the trivia, whenever an angel shows up in scripture, what's the first thing the angel says? Do not be afraid, just breathe. would make for a good song title. First step, breathe. Just breathe. Second step is to then explore values. So what is it in the midst of this relationship, and in the midst of the conflict, what is it that is most important to you? Figure that out and let that be your guiding light. Now, I've been offering you, intentionally, I've been offering you at the end of every worship service for the whole summer, I've been offering you not one, not two, but three values for you to reflect upon. God loves you. You are a cog pal. You are a person, you are a child of God and a person of worth. And we are called to go love our neighbor. A few people came up to me and have, and have shared stories of, I love that. I learned that as a kid in, in grade school, you know, of Jesus loves me, this I know. Or, you know, that's kind of, you know, Pastor Eric, that's, that's, that's elementary. That's kind of intro. That's kind of basic. And I look back and I say, or is it foundational? Yes, it's basic. Jesus loves me. That's all I need to know. But some people don't know that. 
And if we don't know that God loves us, if we don't know that we are cog pals, if we don't know that we are called to go and to serve our neighbors, then basically we're the Kiwanis Club. So I'm offering you some foundational values to reflect upon when you get in the midst of stress. S, take a step back. Academic word is called distancing. Just get some distance. Ask the question, what is the other person thinking? What is the other person feeling? I'm guessing we're not twins. We're not clones. I'm guessing you have a different perspective. I'm guessing you might have an idea. Notice I didn't say it was a good idea. Humor's good too. But just take a step back. Remember in scripture it says that we're supposed to love our neighbors and pray for our enemies? Do you know why those are always linked together? It's because your neighbor and your enemy is the exact same person. So we need to get a step back. And if we do not see them as loved by God, if we refuse to recognize that they are a cog pal, welcome back to Hitler and Nazism. If we don't see the value in them, then there's no more relationship. So take a step back and refocus. T is to try again. So within scripture, you've heard, you heard Jesus say that you know if they make you walk one mile, go two. If they slap you on one cheek, offer the other one. If they take your coat, offer them the shirt. Keep trying because the relationship is more important than being right. In numerical terms, do you remember when Peter went to Jesus and said, how often do I have to forgive? Is it seven times seven? Now, those are religious numbers, which means perfection. And Jesus said, no, not seven times seven, but 70 times seven, which means infinity. Keep trying. Don't write them off. As a child of God and a person of worth, they deserve that love that you are willing to give to yourself and to others. Let's bring it home. The point is, within our Christian faith, the goal is not to be right. The goal is to be in relationship. The goal is not to be at peace. The goal is to be your best self. Now let me repeat that one, because there's a lot of Christians who are fleeing. They just want to keep the peace, and so they leave. They don't want to have those difficult conversations. They don't want to get in there when things actually get hard. What God is saying to us is that God created us a certain way, and if we can take a deep breath, if we can explore our values, if we can take a step back, if we can try again, our best selves are actually the selves that God created us to be. And if you can be your best self and I am my best self, I guarantee you, we still, won't di- we still won't agree. There will still be disagreement. There will still be hard conversations. But you and I, at our best selves, there will be peace. Peace within the relationship because we know that that is primary and what is most important. So as we live with family, as we're on road trips, as we've got a cantankerous boss, as we've got a coworker who steals all of our great ideas, as we've got children who aren't doing what we want them to do. Life is what? Fine. And I bet you that if Pharaoh had done these four practices, he could have avoided at least half of those plagues. May we do the same. Let's be in the spirit of prayer as we come to communion. Gracious and almighty God, as we come to celebrate this holy sacrament, 
We remember the story of Moses. We remember how he took his staff and hit a rock and water flowed in the midst of desert. Water that was the very source of life. The story that as they are, are traveling around the wilderness for 40 years, there is there's nothing left to eat, there is no sustenance. And so you provide in the morning through the, through the dew this, this doughy substance and they say, manna, what is that? But it is the bread that daily gets them through. A similar story in the Gospels. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and he is tempted to turn some stone into bread and he is sweating so profusely before his crucifixion that that blood drips from his face. God, today we are here in order to remember. Remember that as you were with your disciples on that night, you took some bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body. This is the sustenance you need for your spiritual journey. And then after supper, he took the cup, again gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. It's the cup of the new covenant. There are promises and there is life in what you drink. Whenever you eat, whenever you drink, remember me. So Almighty God, today we remember these acts in your son Jesus Christ. We ask that this blood and juice can be for us the body and the blood of your son Jesus Christ so that way, that way we can be one with Christ, one with each other in our fellowship within our congregation and then one in ministry to all the world. All this we pray in your name, through your son, in the power of your Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, amen. I would invite my two assistants to come forward at this time, please. And as they do, just a reminder, uh, since we're doing communion out here in a new space, um, we will come forward in the center aisle. Make sure not to bump the cart with uh, our, our live stream. And then on your other side is the uh, offering plate for you to, to drop your gifts and your offerings. I will have the bread here in the center, and then you can split for uh, juice on either side and return to your seats by the side aisle. I think that'll cover us. And Ben is going to play a song for us as we do this. Wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you.
stand. And feel free to join in when the words are making sense, okay? You can repeat with me. I am loved by God. I am a cog pal, a child of God, a person of worth. I am called to go and love my neighbor. And we can do that now as our best selves, can't we? Because it's based on theory, it's scientifically proven. Did I tell you I had a PhD? It's biblical, it's the way that God calls us to be. So let's be our best selves, and let's go love the world. Amen.